Hello everyone. My name is Jos Gerardin. I'm uh, one of the founders and also the CEO of Yields.io. Um, and today, and welcome to our se seminar on machine learning techniques for model risk management. Before I get started, just a few practical points. Um, the seminar is split up in a few different sessions. If you have any question, feel free to use the Q&A button that you should see either at the top or at the bottom of your screen. You can post any questions there and in between different, um, different parts of this, this webinar, I'll answer the questions that would come in. Um, so feel free to ask uh, as many questions as possible. It's always good to have interactive sessions. Um, so that's one thing. And then secondly, we're also recording this seminar. We'll distribute the link to the recording afterwards. So you can also share this um, with some of your colleagues if you want to. Okay, so let's get started. <clears throat> the topics of today are first, because this webinar has been organized to celebrate our recent Risk.net award, we would very quickly uh, like to highlight some of the, the, the technology framework, the platform that we have built. Um, this platform is called Kyren. Um, and then we move into the main topics of today. So there is basically two parts. First of all, I would like to illustrate how you can actually use um, some machine learning or AI techniques to improve the efficiency of mo model risk management. And then in the second part of this talk, I would like to turn things around and speak about the model risks, the new types of model risks that are associated to introducing AI or machine learning techniques into your enterprise. <clears throat> Good. So to get started, um, first, let me give you a very brief introduction to, say, Kargan and model risk management in general. So um, as we all know, model risk has evolved a lot over the last 10 years. 10 years back, uh, when we were witnessing the London Whale incident uh, at JP Morgan, I think one of the key lessons there was the fact that actually to implement proper model risk management, you need to have governance in place. You need to have proper procedures, proper documentation, different teams that look at the different types of models that are being used. And this is sufficient to limit the type of risk that was materializing during the London Whale. Nowadays, with the introduction of machine learning and AI techniques, what has happened that is that many models evolve much faster. The calibration of training of models happens almost continuously. Things can definitely go wrong at a very shorter time scale. Um, and, and this is a very important point. And secondly, the type of risks uh, that materialize as part of model risk incidents are slightly different. Um, if you read the news, we've seen recently the issue Issue related to gender bias and Apple credit card limits, for instance, or a very well known story from, from a few year, years back on uh, Amazon, who's using AI to recruit uh, developers and again discovered bias in these uh, algorithms. So, this type of bias and the reputational risks associated to it is definitely an element of model risk. And then you have also very subtle type of problems like uh, adversarial examples, um, the fact that sometimes models can be confused maximally um, by just having a very small perturbation on the input. This type of items, this type of issues don't have happen with standard classical models, but they definitely happen as part of um, AI introduction. And this is, I think, important to take into account when dealing with novel types of model risk. So because of this, <clears throat> Banks and financial institutions in general are faced with an, an, an increasing number of challenges. First of all, they, they are looking at increased costs of implementing proper model risk management objectives. Um, and, and these costs are, of course, related to the fact that the number of models under management increased, increases over time, again, because of the introduction of new novel model types, such as uh, machine learning techniques. 
and then these type of new models, they typically don't fit very well in traditional model inventories or traditional technology solutions to help with model risk management. And that drives cost upwards as well. And I think a third item here is the fact that nowadays banks compete for talent also with tech firms. So if you have a data, if you're looking for a data scientist, you will have to compete against Google or Facebook to, to, to actually hire the best talent. And this is of course not very straightforward. And of course, a second challenge is definitely capital consumption. Know that regulators are more and more strict. The risk of having more capital add-ons because of improper model risk management is higher. And that's of course a, a big issue as well. So many banks are looking at technology to help address those challenges, to reduce costs, to replace legacy IT, IT systems, to improve process efficiencies to improve also model development and monitoring and hopefully also to implement better model risk management practices and therefore lower capital requirements. So this is really an, a, a, something that we see across the industry. We see many organizations looking at technology today to help address some of those um, pain points. And this is exactly what we have uh, also done. Uh, we have built a platform called Kyren that is used for what we would call data-driven model risk management. So the, I think the three most important aspects uh, of, of this platform are first of all, that we help validation, but also first or third line teams to actually keep the links between all the data, the analytics that are run and the reports that are generated. And because of this introduction of novel model types, we also provide proper data and calculation infrastructure so that model validators can, for instance, deal with the very large and un unstructured data sets that are often used by AI algorithms. We're also using machine learning techniques um, to help enrich the type of analysis that you can do. And as part of this talk, I would like to present some of those techniques um, to, to you. But of course, we use this as somehow an enrichment of the analysis. We still have the classical types as well readily available. Um, the second and the third point here is the fact that we are definitely, we, we fully understand that a financial organization is a complex organization with many different types of software with a lot of infrastructure. So being able to integrate with this is extremely key. And the last point is, that, point is that we want to foster collaboration between different teams. We have use cases, we have clients across all the lines of defense and we really foster collaboration so people can actually look at the same type of analysis together. And so this is a platform that was awarded the Risk Technology Awards uh, for 2020. And that's why we want to give you a very brief uh, insight in, in this platform before going into the main topic of today. Okay, so I don't see there is no questions yet. So I'll just move on to the first part of this talk, which is about managing model risk with AI. So if you look at the different tasks that are relevant in model risk management in general, I think there is basically three different parts where machine learning can actually help. So first of all, it's to be able to scale the work properly. And scaling means more testing, more benchmarking, for instance, but also it means scaling to larger data sets. If you are using for, if you're building, for instance, a liquidity model, and you might have very large amounts of data, and maybe you want to actually work the model, work out a model that works on, say, the individual client level and not just on the aggregated part. So this would require huge data sets and therefore, you need actually algorithms that are able to deal with those large data sets. And machine learning algorithms are always developed or very often developed with this type of scalability in mind. And we also have the technology capabilities these days to actually run algorithms and train algorithms on those data sets. A second point where machine learning can help is definitely to increase efficiency. Efficiency of testing by, for instance, generating relevant scenarios to test your models, but also to more quickly detect issues. For instance, an example that I'm going to cover today is how to detect anomalies in, in large data sets in an automated fashion, being able to detect anomalies and, for instance, the behavior of a model and say, to detect stability issues, for instance, and the prediction of a model is extremely important if you want to quickly identify a problem. And the third 
a third item where we see lots of use cases across the industry is to perform what we would call orthogonal types of tests. So for instance, from an, for an audit team, an audit team who would like to devise some additional tests on top of an existing model validation process, it's interesting to be able to use other types um, it's interesting to use other types of um, tests that would not be available yet uh, and say more classical classical statistical tests. <clears throat> Good, then um, I would like to, before we dive into some of the examples um, of how you can like realize those type of efficiencies, I would like to give a very brief introduction to say some of the most famous types of machine learning algorithms, which would be neural networks. So neural networks typically are organized as say a set of neurons that work together. Those neurons are typically organized in what we would call layers. Um, and so you have clearly an input layer where you have the input signal uh, traveling into the neural network. The output layer is where the outputs are produced, obviously, and then hidden layers are the layers in between. Traditional neural networks uh, can be, say, uh, two them have can have two dimensional layers, but for instance, convolutional neural networks often have higher dimensional layers. This over here is what we would uh, call a feed forward neural network because all the signals are moving in one direction from the input to the output and this is also called a fully connected neural network because each neuron in one layer is connected to all the neurons in the previous previous layer now a neuron in itself is a kind of non-linear transformation which would take the inputs um, multiply it with a weight with a weight, sum it together with what we would call the transfer function, and then apply typically what we call an activation function, which can be a nonlinear or a linear transformation um, to basically compute what the output of that neuron, which is called the activation. <clears throat> so as you can see, each of those neurons has already quite a few parameters. And if you have many neurons organized in a neural network, you will really have a huge number of different algorithms, uh, different parameters in the network. And therefore, um, overfitting is definitely an important point when calibrating or training neural networks. Um, you also have other types of neural networks which have, um, for instance, loops included. And these are typically used to model autocorrelation um, inside time series. Now, on top of the traditional parameters, machine learning uh, algorithms also have something which is called hyperparameters. Again, you have the same type of uh, parameters as well in classical models, but this type of vocabulary is typically used here in the machine learning context. So hyperparameters are actually the parameters that govern the training, the overall training of the neural network and, and would also govern the layout of or the topology itself of of the algorithm. So just to highlight this very quickly, let's assume that we are building a neural network that takes as input the coordinates of um, points and the target or the, the purpose of this neural network would be to separate say orange from blue dots over here. So what I can do is build a set of features out of the basic features, the coordinates of, of these, uh, of these dots. So over here, as you can see, we created second order polynomials, but also sign transfer, apply the sign transformation on, on the input signal. And then over here, this neural network actually has two hidden layers, one of five neurons, one of two neurons, and then these are summed together somehow to create the outputs, which would be the probability that a dot would be orange. So hyperparameters would be, first of all, the number of hidden layers, the number of neurons that are available in each of those layers, the fact if whether or not this neural network would be fully connected, which it is, as you can see over here, but then you have other parameters like, for instance, the learning rate, which is the speed at which the weights are updated as part of a training, the activation, so the transformation that you apply at the end of the neuron, neuron and then the regularization terms, for instance. As I said, um, overfitting is extremely important. So over here, we are simply using L1 regularization. There's other types of regularization that are specific to neural networks. So these are called hyperparameters. Now, 
I would like to start our exploration of machine learning techniques in the context of model guest management by focusing on data. So as you all know, in, uh, typically in a validation exercise, up to 80% of all the time is spent on data issues. So being able to quickly evaluate the quality of data set and quickly spot outliers or anomalies is extremely important. So very powerful um, algorithm that is often used in the context of uh, outlier detection is what we would call an autoencoder. So an autoencoder is a neural network that has a particular shape. Um, so in this case, uh, as you can see here, it's a symmetric shape and it has a, a low dimensional inner layer, which is called the bottleneck. Now this bottleneck actually forces all the input signals into a low dimensional representation because this neural network tries to approximate the identity function. So I have a sample in my data set, which I would call X. The output X prime is basically, has, it has the same dimension and should be as similar as possible to the inputs, okay? But the, the challenge, as I said, for the neural network is the fact that all the signals have to travel through this low dimensional representation over here, the bottleneck, and therefore the model needs to find a very efficient way of encoding or of doing dimensional reduction. So that dimensional reduction is done in the first step here, the encoder, and then the reconstruction from the low dimensional to the full uh, dimension representation is called the decoder step. Typically, we are using a, a distance, an error measure to, to, to basically compute what we would call the novelty score. And so if the error is high, so if the X prime, the output is very different from the input, then it actually means that there is, there is not that many samples inside the data set that, that are very similar to this particular uh, point. And this is why the neural network is not able to actually properly encode and then decode that particular example. So what we normally do when we train uh, auto encoders on data sets for anomaly detection is to basically um, train on the entire data set that contains both outliers and inliers. And then we organize the, the data, the data uh, from say, high reconstruction error to low reconstruction error. And the highest ones are those points that are very atypical inside the data set. There are a few subtleties associated to autoencoders, so you need to do a peculiar types of regularization to avoid overfitting. But in general, these are very powerful algorithms. They are, they are a little bit similar to doing a PCA, um, but actually, um, this is almost the equivalent of, say, a nonlinear PCA that has been implemented in an in, in, in infrastructure that can actually scale very efficiently. Um, and it's also what we would call a self-supervised or unsupervised uh, algorithm. So you don't need you don't need to have a label training data set with labeled outliers to actually identify atypical data points. So we are using this very often to highlight issues with data, and this works in multivariate data sets, for instance, for credit, but it also works to identify issues and, for instance, interest rate curves or volatility surfaces. The second example that I would like to quickly discuss today as a way of using machine learning to improve efficiencies and um, model risk management is to do scenario generation. So, it's very often important to quickly be able to, gen to generate good scenarios, for instance, to understand under what conditions model fail, models fail, but also to perform, for instance, stress testing. And being able to quickly generate scenarios that are realistic um, is often an, a, a challenge. There are two families of um, machine learning algorithms that can be used for this type of tasks. Uh, one is what we would call variational autoencoders. The other one, which is something which we call GANs or generative adversarial networks. I would like to explain a little bit how those second family actually works. So you have a, a pair of a generator, which has a neural network to generate synthetic data and a discriminator, which has a neural network that needs to identify if a data point that it receives has been generated and is a synthetic data point or is actually a real data point. Now, to 
describe schematically how the training of such a discriminator generator pair works, you can look at this, uh, this picture over here. So let's assume that the real distribution of the of nature set of the data set that we want to generate is this dotted line over here. Then we start with say an initial state of the generator, which would basically be represented by this green curve over here. And the discriminator is the blue dotted line, as you can see. Now, typically if we generate data from this uh, green distribution, then what we will do is we take say, um, we, we take um, a random noise basically, and then we transform it using this cumulative distribution over here to actually create a sample of synthetic data according to this particular distribution. So in an initial, in an initial step of the algorithm, we are going to generate those type of um, points. And then once they have been classified, we actually uh, show that information to both the discriminator and the generator. So the discriminator will learn that if the values of X of the, of the data are high, that actually the probability is very low that this data is real because it, as you can see the modus of the generator distribution is higher than the modus of say the real distribution the dotted line over here so high values will be classified as synthetic low values will be classified as real we also give that for the same information to the generator. So the generator will then discover that actually the discriminator will think that lower values of X are most likely to be real. So in an update and the next update of the algorithm, what is going to happen is that the generator is going to move to the left because that's the way to confuse the discriminator maximally. And so this type of procedure has repeated a lot of, um, and in many cycles, until you reach some sort of an equilibrium. And that equilibrium would be such that the generator will actually fit quite well the real distribution of the data set and the discriminator will not be able anymore to uh, distinguish real from synthetic data points. Now, once you have a trained GAN, you can use the generator to generate synthetic data from noise, but you can also use the discriminator to discriminate very accurately real from synthetic uh, samples. So often this is used to generate pictures, for instance, to generate images. This is taken from a website which is called This Person Does Not Exist. And every time you refresh the website, you will see another picture of a person who has been generated with a gun. However, you can use those type of techniques as well to learn from real data and to actually create synthetic data. So nice use cases are you have a credit portfolio, you have a lot of history, um, you train a gun to create synthetic data sets of uh, fake client portfolios, basically, to see how how your credit risk models behave. Other examples are, for instance, stress testing, where you would generate uh, market data, like volatility services, interest rate curves, synthetically from a historical distribution to be able to like understand better how your model uh, behaves on new data. So this is a second example. Um, and then, I would like to like uh, give you two more examples of how machine learning can help um, in, in improving model risk management efficiency. And the first one is what we would call model risk quantification. So if you are quantifying model risk or model uncertainty, it typically means that you need to use multiple models uh, to to, and compare that with the model that you are validating or the model that is running in production. And basically the difference between, for instance, your production model and the worst case would be a measure for the model uncertainty. So one of the challenges in this approach is that you have to um, sample multiple models and generating models is typically a very costly exercise. Now, in machine learning, you have a technique which is called hyperparameter tuning. And hyperparameter tuning is a way to find the optimal hyperparameters, the optimal training, uh, training parameters and topology of your algorithm to perform as well as possible. So this is how classical hyperparameter tuning is used. However, in the case of model risk management, you're actually interested in understanding um, 
what's the performance, what's the worst case? What's, what would be the performance of a model that has been calibrated on the data, but that's actually not performing very well? So you can actually just inverse the training objective of a hyperparameter tuning exercise and actually look for the worst possible model across a family of models in an automated fashion. You have ex there exist many different algorithms to train hyperparameters and that you could use in this type of exercise. I list a few of them here. Um, the degree of efficiency is typically um, proportional to, as well to the complexity of the algorithms, but especially in high dimensional algorithms, it can be, um, it can be uh, good to actually use some of the more powerful hyperparameter tuning algorithms to sample efficiently the, la the landscape of different models. Good. And the last question, uh, the last example that I would like to um, discuss in this first part of this uh, talk is to use machine learning techniques for monitoring of models that are used in production. So in general, when we are talking about monitoring and model risk management, often this is considered to be something that is like happening, say, once every quarter or once every year, and especially in credit risk models or in other slowly moving models, this is uh, uh, the, the right frequency probably. However, if you're moving towards trading or algorithmic trading even, then somehow real-time monitoring of models becomes important. Now, in general, being able to monitor um, complex models can be hard, especially if the models themselves uh, are difficult to replicate. And that's why sometimes we use what is called surrogate models um, to, to, to assist with the monitoring. So a surrogate model is typically a simple model that has been trained on say the output of the model that you are monitoring in general. And the example that I would like to discuss is the example of um, an um, XVA engine that is that is that needs to be monitored. So the XVA engine will produce um, CVA, DVA numbers per portfolio, per hedging set, um, per, per counterparty basically. And the idea of this monitoring exercise is to identify those counterparties where um, you would see somehow a typical behavior of the XVA model. So what we did is we we trained um, a highly regularized model on the day, on the time series of this uh, XVA model output. So on the time series of CVA and DVA per counterparty, and this uh, trained simple model is what you can see here as the the orange lines. Okay, so basically the the purpose of that model is based on the history of this model. We are going to try to predict the change and XVA based on changes in the composition of the counterparties portfolio and changes in the, compo in the market data itself. And so the, the black lines that you see are actually the outputs of the actual XVA library itself. And so by, by looking at the difference between the surrogate model prediction and the XVA library prediction, um, and by, by looking at the statistical signature of it, we discovered a few counterparties that actually had issues. So in the first one, uh, the first example over here, as you can see, there is quite a bit of unstable behavior of this black line. And this was actually related to issues with the Monte Carlo convergence of the XVA library itself. Then we had two examples of issues where, where there was stale data. Um, and so stale data typically leads to some kind of um, bias between say the prediction and then the uh, surrogate model outputs. And then the last example was quite funny as well. So as you can see, you have almost like weekly peaks uh, in the black lines. Um, and this was related to an end of week calibration issue. So this was mostly a portfolio of FX options that had uh, issues on the short term. So th this is just to show that by automatically generate models to predict somehow the behavior of a more complex model. And by comparing those two, you can actually identify some interesting features. This of course is not like a full validation exercise. We're just looking at data, but it's an interesting data driven way of trying to identify typical issues. So this kind of concludes my first part of this webinar where I wanted to talk a little bit about different uh, AI techniques that can be used to improve or efficiency of model risk. I saw that there were already a few questions. Um, so let me try 
to at least see the questions. Um, one minute. I'll, <clears throat> I'll quickly stop sharing because there seems to be an issue to see the, uh, the questions themselves. Okay. So the first question is, have you attempted to use these techniques to build and calibrate the Heston stochastic volatility model? So um, to, to calibrate a model in general, well, so, so if you have just simply the classical uh, Heston stochastic volatility model and you want to calibrate that model, then um, of course there exists many traditional um, calibration techniques, of course. Um, the, the, if you want to improve, for instance, the calibration itself, um, and for instance, a very well-known example of this exercise is what is called rough volatility. Rough volatility models are very hard to calibrate. And therefore what people did is to first train a neural network on the rough volatility model, and then basically evaluate the model through its approximation to the, 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 the neural network itself. And this was a way to speed up, say, the um, calibration of a model. So that's a way in which you would be able to like uh, use some of those machine learning techniques to calibrate the Heston model. However, in general, Heston, uh, Heston models can be implemented very efficiently and therefore this looks a bit like an over, overshoot. And another use case, which I cannot really discuss in today's talk, talk because of time, uh, time issues, but the second issue was as or a second example is that you can use actually um, neural networks to solve partial differential equations as well. So you would be able to solve the Heston equation using a neural network and then use that neural network actually instead of a more classical implementation of a Heston model. So that's, uh, that's, that's one example. Um, <clears throat> There is another, another question related to a GAN. So is generating data using a GAN reliable to train a model on? Okay, so this normally, um, so, so of course, generating data sets as a sensitive type of task. Um, so you would in general, um, uh, you, you can in general do this to like uh, use GANs to generate alternative data sets and then train your model on this. And actually this is not a unique example. You have, for instance, very often techniques to do oversampling, for instance. So if you are building, um, if you're training, say, a credit decision model and the data set is very unbalanced, imbalanced, then you can use machine learning te techniques to generate many synthetic data points that uh, represent defaults so that you can have a bit more of a an, um, balanced data set which would help in training the data. So, so it's not um, using synthetic data is something that happens a lot. If you want to use GANs to generate data to train your model on, you can definitely do this. Um, one point of attention is that GANs in general can have somehow some um, um, training or stability issues. So th there is a very careful type of training that needs to be done. But once the GAN converges, the data that is going to be generated is very realistic. There seems to be a few more. Um, I'll just pick one or two more and then I'll move on. Um, and I will record all the other questions and uh, we will, if possible, uh, send them over, send some answers over after the call as well. So the other question is, um, how can we use GANs to generate synthetic data to calibrate PD models for which there are very few default observations so as to robust robustly calibrate the model. So indeed, yes, this is, this is a bit similar to the point that I just highlighted, the fact that if you have very imbalanced data sets, that actually you, would for, you might first consider to create um, more examples of say defaults um, by doing oversampling. Um, there exists many techniques for this. Smooth is a very, a very well-known one. And so you could actually oversample first and then train the GANs. Another Another aspect that is sometimes used is what is called transfer learning. So with transfer learning, you would first train your GAN on say a higher default data set, 
and then the trained model would serve as a starting point to train again further on the low default portfolio. So this is called transfer learning. It, it exists, there exist papers um, to do this for GANs as well. And that's definitely a way in which you can kind of circumvent the issue related to having only very few defaults in your data set. Okay, so let me know, share my screen again and move back to the and, and move back to um, the, oops, I'm sorry. And move back to the presentation itself. So <clears throat> the second part of this uh, talk is about how to manage the model risk related to AI and machine learning. Good, so there's been over the past year, year and a half, there has been a few initiatives from regulators um, to incorporate, say, AI algorithms, machine learning technology, insight model risk management. One of the first to comment on this was the Fed. Um, and not extremely surprisingly, the Fed uh, said that a very good starting point to, to look at model risk management for ma machine learning would be to um, to start from existing policies and then highlight in detail which elements actually need a little bit more attention. And this, this is going to be say, the, point, the starting point for this second half of the talk, where I will start from the existing SR117 regulation and then highlight some of the points that are specific to machine learning. Since then, there's been a few more initiatives uh, quite recently, and the Singapore Authority also published um, some framework to deal with machine learning that is also interesting to read. Good, so we all know SR117 very well, I'm sure, um, but there is a few points in that regulation that really require more attention in, when dealing with machine learning algorithms. The first one is model dependencies. So model dependencies, the fact that one model the output of one model can be the input of another model. These are important aspects in a model risk because of course, if you have an issue in one model, it will, it will impact the downstream models as well. So there is very typical dependencies in a traditional machine learning pipeline. So understanding those dependencies is, is important. Then the second point that, is in, that, that can be interesting to, to look into is really the framework, the model risk management framework, the underlying assumptions of the model that differ a little bit. So for the framework, I will show some examples of typical issues that can exist with AI that are not very common with more traditional modeling approaches. So your model risk management framework should be adapted to deal with it. And with respect to assumptions, um, so of course, machine learning is much more data driven than more classical, uh, but bottom up approaches, uh, for instance, in valuation models. So there, the assumptions are also a little bit different. Um, when it comes to model design and performance testing, there are some peculiar points like bias detection, for instance, and I'll, I'll have a, I'll spend a few minutes on that as well. And then the last point that is important of course, as part of a model risk management analysis, you need to properly understand the limitations of your models. In the context of data-driven modeling, like machine learning, the, the limitations are, of course, mostly related to the data itself, and especially the data size. So depending on the size of your data set, the type of algorithm that you should use uh, needs to differ. Good, so let's start with the first point, model dependencies. So <clears throat> a machine learning pipeline is typically a set of very closely co co connected models that work together. And they're, they're really working together in a very, in a, in a very uh, clear and well-defined fashion. And very often you have like a four different steps. The first step would be say data cleaning. So data cleaning might be when you have more simple numerical columnar data, it would be like dealing with missing data, dealing with uh, anomalies. But 
of course, when you have more unstructured data, um, data cleaning, data preparation can also be like to remove white spaces, to remove stopping words. Uh, so all of this as part of a data preparation step. And very often, this will already be a kind of algorithm to do this type of data cleaning exercise. I just gave you uh, the example of an autoencoder. So autoencoders can very often be used uh, as an of initial data cleaning step. Then the second point is um, feature extraction. So, of course, <clears throat> to build good models, you need to build, first of all, proper features and having um, and being able to automatically look for different types of features as something that is often done in an algorithmic fashion. And secondly, selecting the right features uh, is also an important step. Uh, of course, neural networks in general are not extremely sensitive to um, to, 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 for instance, highly correlated features. But if you would use decision trees, for instance, and you have highly correlated features, you will generate very deep trees. So, so there is, depending on the algorithm, the type of feature selection, feature extraction that you need to do is slightly different. Um, so this is important, of course, as part of a validation, but you also need to, uh, to, to understand that, that somehow the feature selection itself can be an algorithm. And then, of course, once the model, once you have generated features, you need to train the model. Um, so training the model, learning the weights as an algorithm in itself. And then on top of that, we have the hyperparameter tuning. So to basically sample over the different configurations of the model itself. So all of these is again algorithms. And then you have the actual model. Once it's trained, you need to use the boosting algorithm, the, the random forest, for instance, you need to use it to generate predictions. And that in itself is, a, again, the last model. So as you can see here, you really have a set of four or sometimes more very closely connected models that work together. And as a model risk manager, the first question to answer is, how am I going to address this problem? Am I going to validate Am, am, I, am I going to test each of those building blocks separately, or am I looking at the entire model as a single as a single model, really? And am I just looking at, say, the exterior part of this model? Um, both as possible in general. I think I, I, I would have a slight uh, preference for working in a modular fashion because it lowers the number of models that, or the number of building blocks, at least, that you would have to look into. <clears throat> Good, then the second point um, was to talk about frameworks. So there is a, there exists many, um, many initiatives to, to create a set of principles or guiding, guiding rules to, to manage AI in a safe fashion. Um, an interesting paper is the one that I mentioned here from Stanford and Berkeley, um, together with OpenAI and Google Brain. It's already four year old, four year old, but I think it's still quite relevant. And in that paper, there is five principles that have been identified. Um, and so these five principles are really quite different from the traditional types of principles that you would see in a classical model risk management framework. So the first one is about avoiding negative side effects. Um, and, and this is actually what we would call a specification uh, issue. So in general, when you train a machine learning model, you are trying to optimize some kind of a, a, a function. You are trying to optimize a value function. And you need to make sure that you have defined that value function as well as possible. So the example that they give in the paper has nothing to do with finance, but it's a quite nice example. So they're giving the example of a, a cleaning robot that you would train to clean the room efficiently. So if your value function is assigning most weight to say the speed at which the room is being cleaned, then there might be some negative side effects like the cleaning robot that is just throwing everything outside of the window. Um, it would clean the room in a very fast way, but it would not be exactly what you wanted as the end result. So this is really a specification problem. Since machine learning algorithms are very efficient optimizers, you need to make sure that your value function is well defined. And this is related to the second item, which is called reward hacking. So reward hacking is really trying to find issues and the definition of your model. Um, and then the training algorithm is going to like, uh, 
take advantage of those issues. And a very typical example is uh, the example that I show here. Um, at some point, people were training an algorithm to play Tetris. Um, and the objective function was that they wanted to play the game as long as possible. However, what happened is that the algorithm actually discovered the pause button. So that's clearly was not the intent because the intent was to make it play Tetris very well. So again, very closely related to specification of the model and the uh, optimization function. The third point uh, in the framework is extremely important and this is about scalable oversight. So what happens when you are using an algorithm in production is that you will always have to evaluate atypical data points, points that you have not seen very often yet. And so in that case, a machine learning algorithm, a model has to extrapolate. And because machine learning algorithms are so highly parameterized, the risk of overfitting is very high. And so extrapolation can be a dangerous thing. So in general, a framework should also put some emphasis on being able to detect novelty of incoming data so that you can actually do something about it. And in the paper, um, they, they go one step further and they actually discuss as well the fact that you should make sure that the algorithms that you use to evaluate when to hand over to a human expert, basically the decision itself, that the algorithm cannot really try to avoid this because somehow handing over the decision to a human is an extreme, extremely expensive step for a machine learning algorithm. The fourth point is safe exploration. So as part of learning from data, and especially in the context of reinforcement learning, where you basically train a machine learning algorithm to take actions and to see what's the consequence of those actions. In that case, you need to have some budget to explore new data. So a very similar example is if you are, if you're, if you're building credit decision models and you want to see how your model would behave on a novel type of clients, then you would have to have some kind of a testing budget to actually accept some of those novel clients uh, into your portfolio and see what happens. So here as well, when you are training machine learning models, sometimes you need to have a specific budget for exploration, but you need to make sure that the exploration is done in a safe fashion. Again, going back to the cleaning robots and the paper, um, the, the people describe a use case where the cleaning robots would test wet mopping strategies. And of course, if, 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 if the robot gets too close to a power socket, that would not be that good for the robot. So here, really, you need to implement constraints when allowing for exploration of the data. And the last point is a point that we already touched on earlier in this, in this call, which is about robustness I guess, against distributional shifts. So in general, machine learning algorithms, they are nonlinear and very highly dimensional. Therefore, their decision boundary might be uh, not, not very straight and might, might be very complex. And as a consequence of this, you can construct synthetic data samples that maximally confuse the model. So the, the most uh, well-known examples are this type of uh, classifiers, image classifiers. So this is an, uh, an uh, image classifier that has been trained to classify pictures into either gibbon or panda category. And these two, these two pictures for a human are very similar. However, for the machine learning algorithm, this is with certainty, with absolute certainty, a gibbon. Um, so, so this is an example of an adversarial attack many or any any machine learning algorithm um, that has high dimension and non-linearity is sensitive to this type of uh, attacks and it's very hard to avoid these type of examples taking place so the best strategy or the most robust strategy is to kind of run in parallel a more simple model and continuously compare the difference between the prediction of the machine learning model and the simple one a few more points. So I was talking about model assumptions. So of course, when you use data to learn from, um, then the implicit assumption is that the future is going to be um, is going to be very similar 
to the past. Um, this is often the case, but in the case, of course, of like the Christmas turkey, that might not be a very good extrapolation. So being able to 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 to, to test for a distributional shift in a very efficient fashion is important if you are not 100% certain that the future is um, similar to the past. And I think the current the current uh, the, the, the current crisis is definitely a, a place where, where, say, the data that we see now is not as very different from data that we have seen in the past. So having, say, supervised learning algorithms and production can be a dangerous thing. Similarly, um, like, and again, this is very similar to classical models. If you are um, using rules to train your model, then of course you need to make sure that the rules are correct, right? So if I'm building, a neural network to solve partial differential equations to, for instance, compute XVA, then I will may have to make sure that my underlying model is actually correct enough because if the model is not correct, then clearly the, 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 the results are not going to be very correct either. And a very funny example is this example here of a reinforcement learning uh, ex exercise where a model was trained to to control a racing boat and a racing game. And the model actually discovered that by spinning around the boat over here, it was the most efficient way to make a lot of points, um, to score a lot of points. So here again, if the rules are not implemented correctly, then clearly the resulting reinforcement learning algorithm is not going to provide you with the right answer. Um, <clears throat> We are close to the end of the of the webinar. Um, I wanted to quickly discuss also explainability because it has an impact on model design. So if you're building machine learning models, you can either try to build in explainability from the start, or you can use algorithms to generate explanations. Um, there is a typically two different families of those type of uh, algorithms to generate explanations. You have local explainability algorithms. LIME is the most famous one. LIME is going to look for a simple approximation in the neighborhood of one prediction and show you what are the contributing features. Global explainability algorithms are actually the other extreme where you are trying to build somehow an overview of the behavior of the algorithm across the entire data set. Okay, so basically this type of scatter plots over here show the behavior of the outputs with respect to both the with respect to two input signals and to the algorithm and this this type of scatter plots can be efficiently computed um, using algorithmic differentiation that is available in many machine learning algorithms when it comes to performance testing, so testing for bias is very important. And again, bias is a bit more of an issue in machine learning than in traditional algorithms, just because of the fact that you have much more powerful algorithms, much more linearity, therefore much more possibilities to generate fairness and bias issues. Uh, all I'm going to say here is that, uh, as always uh, in model risk, you first want to define uh, bias very explicitly so you can measure it and also guard against it. Um, there is different definitions of bias uh, that you can use. Um, equalized odds is one of the best ones uh, as far as I know. And to conclude, the last point um, in dealing with model risk for AI is really related to say what we would call the limitations of the model. As I said in the beginning, machine learning AI is data driven. Therefore, um, <clears throat> therefore, the key points is that you would like to make sure that there is enough data basically. And, and there exist a few taxonomies. This one here is taken from scikit-learn, a very well-known Python library, um, where basically you have a kind of decision tree depending on the size of your data, the layout of your data set, what type of algorithm that you can use. And I think this is, say, this is a very good summary because it's it's one of the main limitations of machine learning algorithms that you need to have sufficient data. So this concludes the second part and also this, this webinar. Um, so uh, as I hope you have seen, introducing AI can generate considerable benefits. It clearly also presents some risks. And I think as always with model risk, you want to basically make this decision, this trade-off 
really explicit. So if you have a risk appetite framework, you can basically do the trade-off between the benefits and the risks and a more principled approach. Good, so let me see if there is more questions. Um, <clears throat> yes, let me stop sharing for a while again to see the questions, <clears throat> if there is any more. Yes, so for credit risk, the model is normally integrated in the risk management and should be understood by the business. Is there always a functional link possible between input and output data? So if the question here is that if you have a credit risk model, if it's easy to to, to like understand what's the input and what was the result of, of the model. Um, well then of course indeed in, in credit decision model for instance you might have overrides. Um, so if you have overrides it's important to be able to represent them correctly in your data set so you can actually learn from this. And then the last question you need a lot of data but do you also need a good understanding of the data so yes indeed that's a very good question so machine learning is not really a silver bullet you have um you as always when you build models you need to make sure that you build proper features that you are um that, that you're able to make sense out of the data and and of course being able to understand the data better will allow you to generate better to generate better um better features. So in general, I would say that if I have to build a model, I would first just simply use, if it's like a, a supervised learning example, I would definitely first start with just linear regression, but very carefully craft the features. And then only then, when you understand everything, move towards a more sophisticated algorithm like a machine learning algorithm. Good. Um, there was a question also on equalized odds. Um, so I, I will, because we are running out of time, I will share the paper uh, of equalized odds also as part of the the, the follow-up after this meeting. There's also a question to ask for the slides. So what we're going to do is to send to all the attendees both uh, the slide deck, a link to the video, and uh, if there is indeed more questions on say, uh, papers, we can forward those papers as well. And finally, if there is um, any more questions, do not hesitate to ask uh, them. You should have also the, our contact details. So we're looking forward to continuing the conversation. That's it for today. Thank you very much for participating in this seminar. Um, and I hope to get in touch again really soon. Bye-bye.